We want to welcome everyone here today. As we begin this meeting today, we do give honor and praise to our Lord, for it is through him that this knowledge and wisdom has come. It's through him that we have received this revelation. Today, we will be speaking about how to avoid backlash. These are attacks of the enemy. What is it and how we can avoid it? It's a very important topic because our Lord has paid the price and we want to receive all that he has for us. If you come on, uh, under an attack, either after a visit to the courts of heaven or after receiving prayer, or sometimes it happens as we walk through life, it can be repercussions either from your behavior, something you've done inside the courts, or something you've done after you leave, something you've done after intercession and prayer. We have come to refer to this as backlash. The Lord has revealed that this backlash can come from our actions. Even if we have not entered into the courts, it is a consequence of our behavior that allows the enemy to attack us. It often manifests after actions involving the spiritual realm, including intercessory prayer. Now, knowing the symptoms of backlash will help you to recognize when it happens to you. Knowing what may cause it will also help you understand how to get it removed, how to get it stopped. Should the enemy come against you after you've received prayer or even while you remain at the throne of grace? When you are at the throne of grace, God expects you to do two things, to learn his ways and to implement what you're learning into your life. If you do not do this, then backlash may occur. Often we tell people that if you receive something that's coming against you and making your life difficult, go back to the last class that you went through. Did you forget to apply something? Did you not understand something? Once you begin entering into the courts, either on your own or with the guide, or you receive intercession prayer, backlash may occur for some additional reasons. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, study and do your best to present yourself to God to God approved, a workman tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You see, our Lord has paid the price for us to be free from the curse of the law. However, he expects us to learn his ways in order to appropriate all that he's done. If you have not yet studied the word of God, especially concerning the courts of heaven, you can find the, the free book, it's a very short book, Destroying Curses in the Courts of Heaven at Amazon, iTunes, iTunes, or our website. So here is the book, what it looks like. See, it's only a little bigger than my hand. So, and it's pretty thin, not even as big as my finger. So it's a very short book. That can give you the basics about the courts of heaven. Now, backlash is a direct result of our actions and may occur if we're not walking in God's ways, or if we will not submit to our Lord Jesus. If we decide to go in a direction that is opposed to our destiny, if God, if the Lord wants us to do one thing and we decide to go in a different direction, well, that can we can receive backlash for that as well. We see that in the case of Jonah. God directed him to go to Nineveh and give a prophecy and to speak a word of correction. Well, Nineveh, what, what were the enemies of his nation, of his city? They were fighting. He didn't want them to be able to turn and not receive God's wrath. So he went in the opposite direction. He went and got on a ship and started going away from Nineveh. <laughs> well, how many of you know it's not a sin to go on board a ship? But he was running from what God told him to do. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He was going against God's will for his life. 
And because of that, the storm was sent against the ship and he received backlash. He was thrown overboard into the sea and swallowed by a big fish. When we don't go in the direction God has for us, when we are rebelling against his will for our life, we are leaving his protection and the enemy may come against us. He will allow that in order to get our attention. So we'll go back the other way. This is one form of backlash that most people, I think, are aware of. It was very surprising to discover that correction and backlash attacks upon our health, our emotions, that they could come after removing charges in the course of heaven or receiving intercession prayer. There are many reasons that this may occur. I'm aware of some, but I'm sure there are more. But I want to show you what I have learned. There are five things that usually are the root cause of us coming under an attack after prayer. Number one, there's been abuse of authority. Two, we have misapplied the charges. Three, a failure to confess. Four, ignoring court procedures. And five, Jezebel. Don't get me wrong, many people do experience instant relief either during or shortly after intercessory prayer or after they visit the courts of heaven. But unfortunately, others experience backlash or a quick relapse of the symptoms they were freed from. This is the danger when you receive God's grace and mercy, either through intercession or by entering in to the highest places of authority in, un, in heaven and under earth. That is the courts of heaven. So let's take a, a look at some of the root causes. There is the abuse of authority. Unauthorized authority is one, we call it unauthorized authority. And in one, this is one way that we can receive backlash. And it's when we abuse the authority that's been given us or walk outside of that authority. Understanding your rightful authority and how to use it may be one cause of backlash. He did this a couple of months after I started entering the courts of heaven. You see, I went before the judge and I got the charge of abuse of authority for myself. A few weeks later, God miraculously revealed that I had stepped outside of my authority when I made declarations in the courts, things that I haven't received permission to do. This allowed the enemy to place charges against me. And once the judge ruled in the favor of the enemy, he had a legal right to attack me with sickness. So though these events were very unpleasant to go through, they brought great revelation to our ministry. There were direct demonstrations of miraculous proportions that have revealed that abuse of authority outside the courts or inside the courts can bring backlash. If God, as judge over heaven and earth, rules in favor of Satan, who presents a case before him and allows him or his minions to harass us, well, if we are making declarations to overrule the judge, this can place us in contempt of court. Outside the courts, it can also bring severe backlash. This can be declaring and decreeing for healing, financial restitution, rebuking or casting out demons, or breaking a curse that might be, a, might be attached to the charges in the courts of heaven. You see, all four of those things, sickness or, or attacking our finances, a demon um, being attached to someone or, or a curse, all of these things may be allowed because the judge has given the enemy permission because of his case. And you need to get that overruled before you come against it. As it turns out, you don't even need to be the one doing the declaring. Charges of abuse of authority can also come against you if you are agreeing with a petitioner or a prayer led by someone else. This includes online saying amen 
This includes sharing it online. Think of it this way. If you are driving a car and your passenger robs a gas station where you guys have stopped for a moment, you are now a comp an accomplice to that crime and you will be prosecuted. And the judge of heaven and earth will allow the prosecuting attorney to put charges against you. When you are the guide leading a prayer in the courts of heaven or intercession outside of the courts, you are responsible for what is said. If you are a seer in the courts or part of a prayer group, you have the gift of a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, you're able to receive from the spiritual realm, your consequences may be less, but you've also joined with the inappropriate action. We must learn to follow the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. He will let us know when it is time to make a declaration of freedom. Now, learning about the course of heaven helps us to continually recognize that it is the highest place of authority. That's why we're teaching about it. You see, Jesus, he gave us his name to use and his blood that paid the price. However, when we use that authority without being guided by the Holy Spirit, we may be in rebellion against God's authority as judge in the courts of heaven. Trying to get around consequences that we are suffering with, with the name and the blood of Jesus, is not acceptable. Remember, in Romans 8, 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You must be led by the Holy Spirit. If you are not being led, then you are jumping out in front of him. When we are baby Christians, when we are new to all this, often things will work because God gives us grace for a season. In the natural, it would look like this. A toddler demands playtime from his parents by saying, play, play. At first, the parents may respond to the cute words of the newly speaking child. But as the years pass, the child is expected to learn how to ask, will you play with me? and wait for a response. At full maturity, we are able to recognize when it is the right time to proclaim and when others are busy and playing is not an option. You see, just like children, we grow in our relationship with God. We grow in how we receive from the Holy Spirit. God expects us to learn his ways and grow past the stage of using the name and the blood of Jesus for anything and everything. We should learn to hear from the Holy Spirit so we know when it is appropriate. Now, the next thing that can cause us to come under black backlash is misapplying the charges. In the courts of heaven, you may receive words that have multiple meanings. There are so many events in our life that it can be hard to pinpoint what the group of words is referring to. When looking at my own charges, I haven't always gotten it right 100% of the time. When we don't know what the charges mean, we could be confessing to the wrong things and the charges will remain against us. Even if we hear overruled for some of the charges, there may still be some that remain. If symptoms come up or fail to clear after a visit to remove charges in the courts, you need to look at the words again and ask the Holy Spirit about where we may have missed them. What didn't we get about his meaning? It can help to talk this out with somebody by going over what you think the words could possibly mean. Someone with a gift of interpretation is usually best. Sometimes the questions that the other person asks will prod you in the right direction. Now, we began operating in the courts in 2018. It was a very long time ago. And as our experience in the courts grew, the Lord began leading us into a chamber off the main courtroom more and more often, which he referred to as private counsel. In this setting, the Lord would explain where the issue was coming from in a much gentler way. Since then, we have discovered that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. And he is with the Lord in the courts of heaven. He knows the charges that are against us. 
so we can receive them without actually entering into the courts. So now our team asked the Lord if he wants us to enter into the courts or if our counselor, the Holy Spirit, will address the issue outside of the courts. This is intercession prayer. It keeps us from misapplying the charges and receiving the harsher backlash that comes from appearing in the courts of heaven and not turning from a certain sin. The next thing that can cause you to receive backlash and attack of the enemy is a failure to confess. This is a bit different than misapplying the charges. The word confess means much more than admitting that you were done, you, that you've done wrong. Anyone can see the words and say, oh yeah, I confess to this, that, and the other thing. No, that is not what that word means. The Greek word homologio, translated confess, has a specific definition. It means to come into complete agreement and see it the way the other person does. In this case, God, who is judge over heaven and earth. We have to declare that we know what is wrong according to him and his ways. So when you are trying to remove charges, your feelings will be transparent to the entire courtroom. There'll be the, the host of heaven gathered, all a bunch of people, you know, more than you can see, gathered to watch what's going on in the courtroom. And the charges against you are, are actually sins that you have committed. You have to see those actions the way God does. Wrong is wrong. There is no room for excuses. You may be guilty of a failure to confess or a false confession if, A, you don't really see and don't really feel that you what you did was truly all that wrong, or if you feel like you were justified in your action because of something that happened to you. Your feelings, if they are not in agreement with God when, and you're making excuses for your bad behavior and sin, will cause it to be a false confession. You will be guilty of a failure to confess. In heaven, I've seen it when somebody does that false confession, they look like a kid, you know, hanging its head, hanging their head and kicking a stone like I'm sorry. You know, that's what you look like to all of heaven. If it's a false confession, you know, you, you can look really bad because it's your spirit that's being seen and, and whatever truly you believe is being displayed. When you're in heaven, there are no excuses for your behavior when you are in the courts. None. To confess your sin, you must know that you made the decision to commit the act that was against God and his ways. You have to be sorry for it. Excuses may make the application of the blood of Jesus invalid as you are trying to justify your action instead of pleading the blood over it, instead of letting the blood take care of it. You see, we always have a choice. No one can make us sin. Sins like that don't count against us. In order for the blood of Jesus to cover it, we must first own that sin and admit that it needs to be covered, that our Lord has paid the price. The story of Job illustrates this point. Remember, Satan was granted the right to test Job, and this was Job's response. Job 23, verses 2 through 4. Even today is my complaint rebellious and bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. You see, Job's situation got worse because he wanted to argue his case with God by presenting facts that he was being mistreated, that he didn't deserve this. And remember, it kept getting worse for him. And this is why. Elihu, the one who spoke rightly about God, first showed what the proper response should have been for Job. This is Job 34. Verses 31 and 32, Amplified Classic Version. For as anyone said to God, I have borne my chastisement, I will not offend anymore. 
teach me what I do not see in regard to how I've sinned. And if I've done iniquity, I will do it no more. This is how Job should have responded. Responded. He should have said these things. When, when your life goes horribly wrong, you should take these same steps. You have to admit that you have been rightly punished. You have borne chastisement. You need to confess that you are turning from that sin. I will not offend anymore. I'm not going to do it anymore, God. Well, how can you say that if you don't know what it is? So that's why you have to know what your sin is. And three, you have to state that you will learn God's ways so that you can understand where you have sinned. Job didn't do these things. He kept insisting that he was righteous and being unfairly punished. God is just and righteous. He is the judge over heaven and earth. Who are we to accuse him of being unfair? As Elihu continues explaining, we see that those what those actions look like to God. Job 34, 37 in the Amplified Classic version. For he adds rebellion in his unsubmissive, defiant attitude towards God to his unacknowledged sin. He claps claps his hands in open mockery and contempt of God among us, and he multiplies his words of accusation against God. We cannot prepare a case for the courts of heaven showing that God is wrong for allowing an attack upon us. That is not the kind of case we can prepare. We must prepare our hearts. We must be determined to find out what sin is allowing this attack to happen and be willing to turn from that sin. Praise God that the blood of Jesus has paid the price for that sin so that when it is found and turned away from, we can be freed. You see, the price has been paid. We no longer have to sacrifice an animal. We no longer have to give something to God saying we're sorry. Jesus made the payment. All he expects us to do is learn his ways and follow them. Galatians 6 Verse seven and eight in the English Standard Version. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. We have to walk in agreement with the spirit of God in his ways. You see, God knows what is going on in your life. Inside or outside the courts, if you request prayer, but there is known sin in your life, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the basics. You know you're doing something wrong. And the Holy Spirit has been arguing with you and you've been arguing back. Well, but, well, but, well, don't expect to get a breakthrough. That it, God knows. He is all knowing. We might not know. And you will be wasting valuable prayer time. If you come in and you're not willing to turn up from the sin, you already know. Okay, now let's talk about the difference between backlash and testing. This is one of the most common questions I get. We, we always say, well, how do we know? How do we know if this is a consequences of something we've done or if I'm being tested? Remember, the enemy was allowed in Job's life for a season. Was this backlash or was, it, was he being tested? The difference between the two is simple. Backlash is because we have sinned and we are allowing the enemy to come in through an open door from that sin. It is often sudden without warning. And we must find the sin and turn away from it in order for the attack to be removed. Now, backlash is because we have sinned. Testing is an opportunity not to sin. We must hold on to what we know about God through a difficult season. Now, testing will happen over and over and over again until we pass the test. So if the same situation arises over and over again and throughout your life, that means you're failing a test and you need to find out why. Job experienced loss and pain to test his love for God. Would he curse God? Would he still love God even when he was being afflicted? 
Now, Job didn't pass the test. He accused God of being unjust. This brought more condemnation. This brought more punishment from the enemy. The enemy asked for more consequences and it was given to him. This was a sin. And because of it, of the sin, the situation got worse. Now, in the end, Job did not completely fail because he didn't curse God, but he really didn't pass either. He kind of got a C minus. Once Elihu spoke rightly, then Job realized where he had gone wrong and he repented and God showed up. If you have been complaining about an attack of the enemy, some horrible situation in your life, then you are as guilty as Job. If you've said, oh, I don't know why God is letting this happen to me. If in your heart you feel like, God, you are, you know, how, how are you a loving God? How can you let this happen? Well, you are as guilty as Job was. You will need to confess and repent for rebelling against God's authority so that he will move back into your life. When we go to the courts of heaven, or we bring you into intercessory prayer, if we do any of the following, we will be as guilty as Job. We, we will have made his mistake. We cannot make excuses for our behavior. We cannot attack the enemy who may have a right to an attack us. And we cannot attack others who, may, who God may be using to bring correction. If you have done any of these, you will need to confess that you have rebelled against God's authority. Instead, you have to do as Elihu suggested. You have to admit that you are rightly and justly being punished. You have borne chastisement. You have to confess that you are turning from sin and that you will not do it anymore. That's, you will not offend anymore. And three, you have to state that you will learn God's ways so that you know where you have sinned. This is the way to remove backlash or consequences from failing a test or walking in sin. If you are receiving backlash or um, testing and you're not sure which, I always do this. I always say, Heavenly Father, gosh, you know, I, I am sorry if I have offended you in any way. If I have, if I have sinned and I'm doing the wrong thing, I am so sorry. But Jesus, you are my healer. You're able to deal with this and to remove it from me. If there is anything blocking you from, from helping me, Lord, just show me what it is. And I will be happy to turn from it for you are able. See, when you say something like that, Jesus, you are able to do this. It's not beyond you. It's easy for you. You are worshiping the Lord. And so you put it in the Lord's hands, but you also say, but if I am wrong, if there's something I need to turn from, if I have opened a door, Lord, just let me know. Holy Spirit, speak loudly to me so I can remove it. You see how a cry like that from your heart, really meaning it. Boy, we have received healing so many times just with that prayer. Because if it is an unlawful attack from the enemy, it will be removed. Sometimes if it's just a natural thing on this earth, the Lord will heal you because you are willing. That's what you have to be. It's your heart. The, the next thing that we need to know is that if we have ignored court procedures, it may bring consequences. Once you appear in the courts of heaven, you are making it known that you're aware of two things. One, the courts of heaven are the highest place of authority. Two, the enemy may have legal rights obtained, he obtained by placing charges against you. You're, you're stating these things. If the Lord calls you to enter into the courts, know that it's a serious matter. The enemy sees you there. And if you receive charges and don't deal with them, he gets to place additional charges on you. So after clearing charges through the courts of heaven or through intercession prayer, you cannot go back to binding and rebuking without waiting on the Holy Spirit to let you know that the enemy is acting outside his authority. If you do this, then you are relying on formula prayer created by man instead of the Holy Spirit. Our counselor knows what is happening in the courts of heaven, and he will tell you with great strength. He will tell you when you are to bind, rebuke, 
or declare healing if you don't get a strong leading, but you continue to proceed according to the way you've always done it, then you risk having charges being placed on you in the courts of heaven. You could be in contempt of court for ignoring court procedures. Now we're at the last thing. The very last thing you need to be aware of concerning backlash and attacks of the enemy is Jezebel. Revelation 2, 22 says, listen carefully. I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her. I will bring her into great anguish unless they repent of her deeds. If you are suffering from pain or sickness that isn't resolved by entering into the courts of heaven or receiving intercession prayer, then you may have allowed a, Je a Jezebelic spirit to have a place in your life. The worst part about this demonic attack is that it's so very hard to spot, especially within ourselves. This is one attack that no one can help you clear through prayer inside or outside of the courts. You must take care of this by repenting for the sins that have given her a place in your life and by revoking any access you've given to her through those actions. We can find out what may be against us, but until you stop doing it, that spirit, the spirits known as a Jezebelic class of spirits will have that place. In 1 Corinthians 11, 30 and 31, it says, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. This is a verse in the New Testament after Jesus left. You see, he came so that grace could be shown to us, but that doesn't mean that God is not judge. We still have an adversary. Revelation 12, 10 in the Amplified Classic Version, for the accuser of the brethren, he who keeps bringing before our God charges against them night and day has been cast out. It's not until we get through the end times, through a segment of them, it's not until we get to that point that Satan is no longer bringing charges against us. He is still bringing charges in the courts of heaven against us night and day. He isn't upon the earth yet. We need to continually check ourselves against the word of God. Are we walking accord, according to his ways? Having fellowship with other Christians can be instrumental in remaining free. We have to keep going until you find out what is hindering you. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about today are leaders and backlash. If you choose to guide others in the courts of heaven, you run the risk of getting a very unique form of backlash. If you know the danger, it can often be avoided. If you're considering guiding others in court visits, remember the Lord said it's the same as being a deacon. Here are the attributes the Bible says one should have to be a, a deacon. One, you must be sincere in what you say. Two, you must be temperate. Avoid too much wine or liquor. You must avoid being greedy for gain. It shouldn't be about money and obtaining wealth. You should be knowledgeable of God's ways, especially the courts, if you're going to operate there. You need to endure a time of testing. You must be self-controlled, steady, trustworthy in all things. You must avoid gossip or flighty behavior. You must have one spouse, and you must manage your children and your personal finances responsibly. Guides must first be tested and found blameless and beyond reproach in their Christian lives. That's according to 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 12. Before you begin guiding others in the courts through intercession prayers or on your own, you should look at the list and make sure you're ready for that responsibility that comes with the position you're taking in the kingdom of heaven. A guide in the courts has a responsibility of leading the prayer. It is mu it's the next level up for intercession. Intercession is a basic level that can include soul healing. It can include guide guidance from the counselor. But entering into the courts you're entering in a 
big place. You're entering before all of heaven. You're standing before the judge. You may be called upon by the Holy Spirit to bring correction. Remember James 3.1 in the Amplified Classic says this, not many of you should become teachers, self-constituted censors or reprovers of others. My brethren, for you know that we teachers will be judged by a higher standard with greater severity than other people. Thus, we assume a greater accountability and more condemnation. When you lead others to visit the courts of heaven, when you lead people in intercession prayer, you are bringing correction and teachings to others. Consequences for sin may be harsher. This is a job for mature, well-grounded Christians who are ready, ready to run to God at the first sign of an attack from the enemy. These principles will apply to all leaders. If you are a leader or of prayer, if you are a pastor, if you're a worship leader, all of these things apply to you. A recent visit in the courts of heaven revealed several key factors about operating in the fullness of what the Lord has provided for us. You see, freedom and healing, both physical and emotional, emotional can come quickly. But the courts of heaven, even going there, even if it's not intercession prayer, even going to the courts of heaven is not a one and done matter. Understanding and operating in the courts is a new lifestyle. Listening to the Holy Spirit is crucial. Seasoned Christian, Christians can experience backlash if they operate there. Understanding the courts is the beginning of a new prayer life that, cons that considers the courts of heaven as a possible tool to use when difficulties arise, as the Lord calls us, when he tells us to do it. He is our lead advocate. We enter when he says to. We must always be aware that additional visits to the courts of heaven may be ne necessary throughout our lifetime. Leaders are not exempt from this. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Leaning upon what you know about the courts of heaven is vital for those who are helping others obtain all that Jesus has done for them. There are basic procedures that God expects us to know following the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit must be done in order to receive victory through the sacrifice of Jesus. A petitioner, let's call her Rahab, has graciously agreed to allow me to share with you the details of her visit so you can see clearly the process in action. Rahab had been through the courts of heaven process, yet she so still felt something was blocking her. So she signed up for another visit to receive additional charges. This was before we knew that God wanted private counsel and to ask whether or not, or not he wanted us in. He told us this was our time of training in the courts. And here's what we learned through that training. So Rahab's sister, let's call her Yvonne, she was also needing a visit and was scheduled right after her sister. So they were both sisters were present at the visit. When we began, we asked for charges. Two very discouraging visions were received, which was a heads up that this would be a rough visit. A couple of the words revealed a root of bitterness and unforgiveness, in addition to other words that revealed a time frame. This meant that there was something going on in Rahab's long past that caused a root of bitterness resulting in unforgiveness. Now, many times we think we've dealt with an issue and, and we have tried, but there can still be that root, which is helpful to have the Holy Spirit point out to us. So our counselor brought thoughts of past trauma to Rahab. She submitted her will to the Holy Spirit by confessing to those present all the things from her past that she had never, ever expressed before. You see, Rahab had been sexually attacked by several men when she was between the ages of 11 and 12. 
She had been staying at a friend's house, and her friend's father visited her room at night to molest her. She told her own father about it, and he told her to keep her mouth shut and endure it. Rahab sobbed as she recounted the incident, revealing that a root was still buried there. One of the seers suggested that she needed to, to declare her forgiveness of these men. And after she did, I gave instructions that surprised me because it was not something that I would think of. The Holy Spirit prompted me to say, now Rahab, ask the father to forgive these men. And if they are no longer in this world, then to forgive the children. The heart of Rahab was clear for everyone to see as she did this, meaning every word. The charges were dismissed, and Rahab received her first visit to the secret place right then and there. She saw a vision. She saw herself as a little girl climbing into Abba's lap, and he pulled a blanket over her. One of the seers verified the vision by declaring what she saw. The seer stated, I saw a warm blanket cover you. I explained what the Holy Spirit was bringing to my heart. God wants you to call upon him as Abba, that is Daddy, Papa. And remember this vision each night before you sleep. He will bring you to the secret place where you are, will experience the sweet sleep that you have never known. You see, she had suffered greatly from insomnia. Rahab began to cry once more because she said, you have no idea what this means for me. I have suffered from insomnia all my life. I wake up afraid that someone will, will assault me while I sleep. We finished the appointment with much rejoicing. It's a quite beautiful thing to see the deliverance and healing from soul healing appointments. Now, next, we placed her sister Yvonne before the judge. As we, we, we reviewed the charges, I heard a loud rumbling sound, and it got louder, and I realized it was snoring. Booming laughter from our group erupted because Rahab was in a deep sleep. She had received her blessing right then and there. We excused her from the meeting, and the words from the Holy Spirit were fulfilled. She had the deepest and most wonderful night's sleep she had had since she was young. Now, while reviewing Yvonne's charges, one of our team members kept posting in chat, I'm repenting for that too, I plead the blood, because the interpretation for many of the words for Yvonne had an effect on the hearts of the team members. So when you're in the courts, if that happens and you're helping out in the courts, the enemy will see, he'll see that there's that charge in your life. You have to be quick to repent as soon as you see that something affects you. Yvonne joked, my appointment is doing double duty. <laughs> she said that with a big laugh <laughs> and all, all the team members joined in. Now that night, I didn't sleep very well. The Lord was speaking to me about reorganizing the ministry and thoughts of my past kept playing through my mind. You see, my uncle, who at one time, when he was about 30 years old, had been caught in my sister's bedroom. She was only 12. My father, her stepdad, insisted that it was her fault and that she seduced him. I found out about this incident several years later, and I didn't see him again until I was 17 years old. At a family barbecue, that uncle approached me as friendly as ever, and I looked at him straight in the eye, and I said, I have spoken to my sister, and I know what you did. Don't ever speak to me again. I turned on my heels and walked away. As it turned out, my uncle died about 10 years ago, and we did never speak again. Although the Holy Spirit kept me awake, reminding, of, reminding me of this, I didn't connect the matter with the possibility of charges coming against me. The next morning, I woke up with definite signs of backlash. My computer wouldn't let me do morning prayers, the live broadcast I do on Facebook, you know, with my first cup of coffee. <laughs> Ah, that's always fun. The pressure surrounding my head, there was pressure on my head. 
it was like a vice was just clamping down. It felt like a balloon was expanding in my ear canals at the same time, pressure in my ears. You see, backlash can, afford, can appear in unique forms. These were just the symptoms this time. I knew it was backlash because I had a busy day. And the more I went to the courts to help others, the worse it got. I struggled to hear from the Holy Spirit, which is usually very easy. With only an hour in between all my appointments, you know, they were back to back except for a one hour break for lunch. There was no time to seek the cause of my own troubles. My head was so foggy, I couldn't think about what, why it was happening. During a visit, I asked for a sidebar with my counselor, the Holy Spirit, and I begged, what is going on with my head? What's on my ears? I saw a picture of myself with a black bag over my head. When it was removed, there was this blob with four tentacles on top of my head, two of the arms held it in place and the other two were in my ears. This was a demon. This was why my head felt so bad. Later that night, as I crawled into bed, I told my husband about the difficult trip to the courts of heaven and how it affected me afterwards. Instantly, I knew what the issue was. See, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart. I hadn't forgiven my father or my uncle for their behavior. Yet I told Rahab to do so. This is where the charges were coming from. The Holy Spirit had also given me a warning dream the night before, which I now considered. In the dream, there was a scholarship that would take care of all my needs. But I had to pass a test first. I wasn't worried. It was an easy test. When the results came in, I had failed. I had scored 24%. I knew something was wrong. Looking at the test, I saw that I was one question off for most of my answers. I had the first 24 questions right, but all the rest were wrong. I had skipped one of the questions that made the rest wrong. I had asked the Holy Spirit what I missed and what was causing me to fail, but I had heard nothing in the previous day. I knew it was something from the, fun, from the foundational teachings of God because of the metaphorical meaning of 24. You see, two is multiplication that can bring maturity. 12 is the government of God. So two times 12 is 24. This was something about being mature in the governmental the ways of God. I had overlooked something somewhere. But where? That day, it proved that it was going to hinder me from receiving from God until I got it corrected. Now I knew what the dream was about, forgiveness. It is one of the first things that Jesus tells us we must do so that his goodness can come upon us. I went to the courts as soon as I understood what was against me. Now I know I don't have to go to the courts. I can give testimony and Jesus will use it for me in the courts. But I did what I had advised Rahab to do. I announced my forgiveness. I asked the judge to forgive those men and their ancestors. When I asked for the charges to be, to be dismissed, I asked for justice to come and for God to restore more than what the enemy had taken. I asked him to increase the gifts that the enemy was trying to hinder. Immediately, the pressure in my head went away. The next morning, I woke refreshed, feeling the strong presence of the Holy Spirit, who is my dearest friend. He was surrounding me once more. I declared to myself, I will not do that again. I dare the enemy to try that because I will not rebel against God's ways. And his attack will only increase my effectiveness for the Lord because I will quickly repent. I will search out the answer of where I'm wrong. As we've said, the courts of heaven is not a one and done situation. As it doesn't solve all your issues for all times. This is why we have intercession prayer and soul healing. Only when you're in really strong rebellion does God call you into the courts. As a seasoned Christian, 
you may hear the judge say, I have nothing against this one in a visit to the courts of heaven. That was a beautiful time, but it was only for a season. I walked out of his ways and got charges, you know, a month later. So if you begin operating apart from God, the enemy will attack you, especially if you're helping to set others free, especially if you've appeared in the courts. Satan and his minions are just looking for a reason to hinder you and keep you from helping others. First Corinthians eleven twenty eight through 31. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For if he eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In other words, they die. For if we judge ourselves, we, we should not be judged. We must continually look at our lives and judge ourselves, confessing and turning from sin. This alone will help us escape judgment and remove attacks of the enemy. Yes, healing, both emotional and physical, can come through prayer, either in the courts, in intercession, or soul healing. However, that is not the purpose for heaven's legal system. When we enter the courts, it is the highest place of authority. It's heaven's legal system. We can hear what is against us to remove what may be blocking us from a close relationship with our father in heaven. That is the true purpose of the courts. It is a way to remove the enemy so we can receive more from God, so we can be closer to him. And we know that we don't have to enter the courts. Only the Lord knows when it is necessary. Leaders need to be proficient in hearing from the Holy Spirit so they know when the right time is to enter the courts and when the right time is to receive from our counselor. That is our message today. I hope you understand a little more about when the enemy may come against you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this word today. We know that you are the just and righteous judge over heaven and earth. We know that we have an enemy, a prosecuting attorney, who may place things against us. But we also have an advocate, our lead advocate, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. Lord, you have paid the price for us to be set free. Show us how to appropriate that freedom. Let us know when we need to enter the courts. We thank you, Holy Spirit, our counselor, for speaking loudly to us. I place each person here in your hands, Holy Spirit. Teach them and guide them, for you are the true teacher. Show them God's ways so they can be made free as our Lord wills. In his name, amen. May God bless you and keep you all. Shalom.